Well, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Barbara Hogue. I'm the chapter coordinator for the ICAA of Philadelphia. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight and to introduce our chapter president, um, Daniela Voith, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Um, thank you so much, Barbara. Um, I, have, I have almost an impossible job or the easiest job in the world. Um, Robert A.M. Stern really needs no introduction. Um, and yet the, the amount that could be said could last from now until the end of his talk, at which point we wouldn't be hearing any of his talking only me. Um, he is literally a titan of design. And um, it is hard to really capture um, the great effect that he has had on, um, on our profession. Uh, he's been practicing um, for so many years and has been involved in education and um, you know, TV shows and um, so many books that he's, I think he's written or he's been, um, he has 20 books uh, written about him and his work. He's authored almost as many, and he continues to be at the helm of an enormously successful practice. I've had the opportunity to um, work with him as a collaborator, his firm and my firm, um, and I've gotten to know him over, over many years, and he's su such an enjoyable person, great your wit, so completely erudite at the same time, um, and um, just, just a fantastic person to spend time with and learn from. He's been a practicing architect, teacher, and writer. He's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, and in 2017 re re um, received the Topaz Medallion um, in recognition of his outstanding service to education. He's the Dry House Prize uh, Laureate. And in um, 2008, he re received the 10th Vincent Scully Prize from the National Building Museum. He's received both the Athena Award from the Congress of New Urbanism and the Board of Directors Honor from the Institute of Classical um, Architecture and Art. And he's been a fellow um, of the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 2007 and a member of the Academy of Arts and Letters since 2011. Um, I know him as a, as a practicing architect. I also know him because he's been the Dean of the Yale School of Architecture where he, he, was, he led that fine institution um, into much better situation than it was when he took the reins uh, for almost 20 years. So he's agreed and I don't know why he said yes, but he did. Um, he agreed to talk to us tonight about the relationship of his work um, to some Philadelphia architects and how those architects have influenced him and um, how he's taken inspiration from them. And I think this is um, just an incredibly uh, nice way to um, talk about his own work, but also to honor the work of, of these important Philadelphians. Um, before I turn it over to him um, completely, I want to um, just make a little unabashed plug. Um, he just published his autobiography. I mean, that is really an accomplishment. It was, uh, came out last week by Monticelli Press and it's called Between Memory and Invention, My Journey in Architecture. I have not read it yet, but I can't wait. And I hope that all of you um, manage to find a copy and read, read it as well. So with that, I turn um, the microphone over to um, Bob and we really look forward to your talk. So take it away, Bob. Thank you, Daniela. Lovely introduction. And I believed every word of it, which is very good. <laughs> um, so because we have a limited amount of time, let's, I would like to cut to the chase. In this, I will be helped by Leopoldo Velarde, who worked with me on my autobiography and is on, on a camera tonight or behind the camera tonight and will be able to um, 
monitor any questions that may come up at the end of my talk. Um, uh, so you, you'll be getting little Zoom messages from him. Um, uh, it's interesting to me um, that the great film about Philadelphia called The Philadelphia Story uh, uh, opened. In, it was written in 1939 as a play, a very successful play on Broadway, and then a film in 1940 where it was nominated, I think, for six Academy Awards and managed to uh, garner two. So here's the poster for that film. So um, uh, it's as old as I am. Uh, I didn't see it when it was first screened, but I've seen it any number of times since. And um, many of you perhaps have seen it, but if you haven't, I urge you, it's probably on YouTube uh, to take a look. It's a delightful uh, film with Katherine Hepburn um, and Jimmy Stewart and Cary Grant of what could be better as a cast. So let's begin. Whereas that was the play, this is my Philadelphia story. Um, uh, so let's go forward. And my Philadelphia story starts pretty early on. Um, you see on, on the left, I'm in Philadelphia in front of the Liberty Bell with my mother and my brother, Elliot, who's nine years younger than I am. And by the way, lives in Philadelphia now. Um, and on the right, I'm with my brother in front of Carpenter's Hall a couple of years later, 1953 to 1955, these two pictures. Um, so we would, I was taken to Philadelphia. We would go to Philadelphia as a family very often from New York, where I was raised, um, uh, because it was easy to get to and wonderfully interesting from a point of view of American history. And as I got older, from a point of view of American architectural history. Next slide, please. Regrettably, when I arrived at Philadelphia, uh, it was busy in the center city, uh, and particularly the Society Hill area, was busily being destroyed. Um, here are two photographs, and not my photographs, but this was the scene around us as we toured uh, Independence Hall and other historic buildings, but everything else, the fabric of the city was in complete disarray. Next slide. By the time I got to architecture school, um, just before I actually entered, I studied, I entered architecture school in the fall of 1960. Um, there was a public, uh, an article in Architectural Forum, then the most impressive American journal uh, by a, a, a young architect and an adept photographer, Servan Robinson. And he wrote about F fearless Frank Furness, an architect who had been completely eliminated from the canon of American consideration at that time. And uh, Robinson <coughs> wisely said, as you can read, um, as these buildings have approached a venerable age, <coughs> the bland curtain walls of today's commercial classicism have begun to fence in their massive old wall. The aged monster's day is passing, unassisted. Victorian Gothic cannot withstand industrialism. For instance, the Provident Life and Trust Company bank has been demolished and the United Firemen's Insurance Company is now unrecognizable. Although the ghost of Frank Furness must still haunt the sites. So um, uh, just as I was embarking on architecture, so I'm somewhat older than I am, but not that much, uh, a young architect um, uh, had uh, also had a, 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 an epiphany in Philadelphia about the value of the past. Next slide. And the loss of the past. In 1960, I, 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 I was a Servan Robinson article. That was my first realization of what I had seen being destroyed um, 10 years earlier when I was a, 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 a teenager. Then at Yale, um, Lou, Lou Kahn, um, the great Philadelphia architect who had been teaching at Yale and had just finished um, uh, uh, a few years before the addition to the art gallery as a very important building was at the top of Vincent Scully's list 
of uh, um, extremely important architects to learn from. And Scully wrote a monograph in an important series. And he kindly asked me to help him with the bibliography. And I then got to uh, meet and spend time with Lou Kahn in his office on, as I recall, 1501 Walnut Street. I could be wrong. Um, uh, and occasionally go out to dinner with him, which his idea of dinner was a sandwich in a delicatessen. It wasn't exactly my idea of dinner. In any case, so I meant I had an early contact with Lou. Next slide. In the course of that research, um, I was able to uncover things that uh, Lou Kahn had either suppressed or forgotten about. For example, uh, one of his student projects at the University of Pennsylvania when he was a student of Paul Craze uh, was for an urban shopping center, a rather prophetic uh, idea of a project and notice the classical composition of the plan of um, uh, arcades, um, uh, uh, open spaces in between a double, uh, 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 um, an atrium in the center. It, it's it filled with ideas that Khan would return to um, in the 1950s um, after his trip to Rome, more about which I will say a word or two later. Next slide, please. When I was researching, uh, helping to research the bibliography of Lou Kahn, I came across the name of George Howe, who had been the chairman of the architecture department basically right after the Second World War. Howe was a Philadelphian, a very um, uh, successful practitioner of uh, houses um, uh, in, in Chestnut Hill and in the main line. Mellor, Meggs, and Howe was his firm, but he was also uh, notable for having had a crise de quarante ans um, and uh, divorcing his wife, divorcing himself from his business partners, and uh, taking up the most advanced modernist architecture. Um, uh, uh, and that was the PSFS building, which you, I hope, are seeing on the screen. Um, uh, uh, my work with um, uh, uh, when I undertook to study George Howe, Vincent Scully said, I must be mad. Why would I want to spend my time with a man that whom he felt had ruined the School of Architecture at Yale? Such as I researched and learned more about him and talked to Lou Kahn, I learned what a wonderful person Howe was and a very good architect, but I never got to know him personally. He was long dead by the time I took on this project. Next slide. How had been a student, he went to Har Groton and Harvard. He was a very patrician type person. And then um, uh, he only came to Philadelphia, by the way, because he married a Philadelphian. Um, but he at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts where he studied, this was um, one of his key projects, which was published at, by the Ecole. And you can see how he was an accomplished um, um, uh, man and influenced in part by uh, 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 the Viennese uh, architecture of that period uh, around 1912. Next slide. Howe came back um, and built what um, uh, it was hardly what you'd call a typical uh, house you build after your four years of uh, abroad studying, but in fact was a glorious house in Chestnut Hill Called, which he called High Hollow, with a beautiful plan of um, a cubic volume, uh, intricately disposed, a central hall stair with a stair going um, down to the sunken garden opening to Fairmont Park and going up and across the balcony to the bedrooms on the second floor. Uh, he used local stone for which he and his partners became famous um, and a very Frenchified massing of the building, certainly reflecting his time uh, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. The house still stands, and subsequently um, I had a chance to uh, visit it on a number of occasions. Next slide. Uh, it influenced me profoundly in many houses, um, uh, one of which we, uh, most notably in North York, in, uh, in Ontario, which is just above Toronto, 
um, the ha North York. And here you see how we paid a homage. Roger Seichter, my design partner with me uh, and I um, worked on this house uh, uh, as an homage to uh, George Howe's house. Interestingly enough, when Howe's house was published in the architectural record, uh, the person who was given the responsibility for writing a rather beautiful essay about it was none other than Paul Cray. And there was in Philadelphia in those days before the First World War, and indeed between the two world wars, a robust cultivated um, uh, interaction between architects of various stylistic and educational persuasions, almost all of whom had the uh, experience of having studied with this great French uh, 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 graduate of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, Paul Philippe Cray. Next slide. A house, a house, of course, was a lavish house. He had quite a bit of money and he married very well. Um, but the typical of the firm was not only other large houses, but also very modest houses like the McManus House in Germantown. But what I, my research has turned out, a, um, a, a file of uh, uh, house sources. So how was working within the local idiom of, of, of Chestnut Hill Stone or uh, uh, Wissahish and Dick and Schist, as it sometimes was called, uh, and also emulating directly the houses he toured with um, uh, Arthur Meggs after the First World War when they returned to France um, uh, again to photograph and measure houses in the countryside, uh, in the Norman countryside, you see on the right. Next slide. At the end of the 20s, as I said, how uh, divorced his wife in 1927. And um, at that point, he was already at work on a new building for the Philadelphia Saving Fund Society, um, which he was commissioned. Uh, he had done some sort of branch banks um, uh, along um, uh, Broad Street. Um, uh, uh, but uh, this was to be a new building, not a headquarters, just an office building with a, a major bank facility on the second floor. Um, as he moved along with this design, uh, it took time for uh, it, it to gel and he rejected his very um, uh, uh, Viennese inspired uh, uh, design and instead hooked up with a Swiss architect, modernist of, pers of persuasion named William Lascaz and they assembled a brilliant team of young architects, some of whom would actually bid at the Bauhaus. And they res the result was PSFS, the tower, now a hotel, but on, 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 um, uh, in Center City, a building you're all very familiar with. Um, but I think I should remind you, if you don't know, that Howe's client, Mr. Wilcox, the president of the bank, um, was a, a, a bank president who wrote and spoke Latin. Maybe the Pope speaks Latin, but not many other people do. That was the level of cultivation of this group of architects, or some of them, uh, certainly French speakers and uh, one or two Latin speakers in Philadelphia at that time. Next slide. A remarkable thing. Much later, I was given the opportunity to add to the skyline of Philadelphia when um, um, uh, John Gattuso and um, uh, and his company um, uh, commissioned um, and, and um, uh, now I can't think of his name. Uh, he died. He's a very wonderful man um, who uh, saw the um, new concert hall through to completion. But uh, Willard Rouse uh, uh, had in mind to build a new uh, uh, building uh, and ultimately to attract Comcast, a very important company based in Philadelphia. And here you see the various schemes, next slide please, that we developed leading to its construction. Interestingly enough, Comcast, um, uh, uh, Rouse had already developed with the Liberty Towers by um, uh, 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 10 years earlier, um, whose important but bulky uh, form on the skyline we set, I set to contradict with a slender tower 
with a tapered profile um, and a more classicizing uh, organization. It is not a classical building in the strict sense, but it has behind it the discipline of classical form, classical composition. Um, next slide, please. The bottom of the building, uh, it sits in a plaza with um, uh, um, um, Lori Olin's design um, and a, 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 a monumental lobby of uh, an atrium uh, with a monumental stair leading down to a food court and also into the suburban uh, uh, train terminal. Uh, so he, you probably all know this building. I hope you do, um, uh, but it is a uh, um, important next step in Philadelphia's towers, of evolution of the towers from the kind of overblown 1980s buildings uh, of um, Helmut Jahn. Next slide. How um, in the, was the first modernist to be given a government position in Washington? And he was the head of the public building administration, but it was during the Second World War and really nothing was done. But at the end of the war, how um, relocated himself in Rome at the American Academy, thinking he would retire in Rome. And he was given a commission for a consulate in Naples, Italy, uh, which in my researches, I uncovered the photographs of the scheme, but knew nothing about. Subsequently, I was able to find more documentation and irony of ironies, we have been hired to do a cultural significance study for the embassy. Now you'll see the difference between what was built and what Howe designed is that it was sentimentalized into a more uh, classicizing manner than, than the more abstract um, uh, uh, classicism that Howe employed, which was derived from the 1930s classicism, which for many uh, uh, architects in Italy and elsewhere had, was tainted by its association with Mussolini. But um, here you see the building uh, as, as it's recently photographed of, of facing the bay in Naples. Next slide. So the circle comes round. Uh, the next in my important uh, of my contacts and learning from Philadelphia, to borrow a phrase in a way of Bob Venturi's, is um, Bob Venturi himself, whose work I was introduced to um, by a fellow student at Yale, Helen Searing, um, and I went down and saw him, and Bob had an office um, uh, in, the, uh, in the back of a townhouse, um, uh, back garden of a townhouse, and he came to teach at, at Yale, um, where I was still a student, and here is my final review, uh, of my thesis review in 1965, at which time Bob was almost finished with the publication of his book, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, a book that changed my life in architecture in innumerable ways. In the photograph you see here, by the way, you can see Paul Rudolph, um, and Serge Chemayev to the immediate left, and uh, the late, the recently deceased Henry Cobb and uh, King Louis Wu, all on the jury. Next slide, please. Bob's house in Chestnut Hill. I was able to tour it with Bob Venturi when it was still under construction. We went in the late afternoon. It, we could hardly uh, thread our way through it, but I realized that this was a stupendous uh, work and um, uh, a, a great uh, um, slap at the um, uh, contradiction, if you will, of the then prevailing modernism uh, at um, uh, uh, Harvard, at the GSD, and also the modernism that then prevailed in the minds of many faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. A, a modernism rooted in functionalism and eschewing historical recall. Venturi's house for his mother was the inspiration for my first house for some college, par a college partner, a college roommate, um, the Wiseman house here in Montauk, which introduced shingles to the, uh, to the design, made it more physically tectonic, if you will. Um, of course, uh, uh, um, 
uh, and in every respect, I was, it was an, uh, the homage of a beginning architect to his mentor. Next slide. Uh, a bit later, uh, 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 with my uh, uh, land legs, as it were, more firmly um, uh, uh, um, of working, I was given the opportunity to design a, a, a house for uh, Paul Lang, the, uh, the music uh, ecologist and music critic. And in that house, taking a cue from Bob, uh, 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 visiting nursing association, I introduced moldings, uh, the kind you could buy in a, in a lumber yard to decorate the, the, the neutral facade of the entrance side of the house. Um, uh, it was painted yellow because the owner's wife wanted to um, evoke South German Baroque architecture. Um, so there were many references and um, it was um, in its moment, a highly controversial work. Um, Andre Stuani, who was a student at the time that this was published in the cover of Progressive Architecture, said it was the most uh, radical work of architecture of its time. Next slide. I won't. I never contradict Andres. Um, at this, just a bit after that house gave gave way to another much more elaborate house and much better materials um, at, in Armand, New York, the Ehrman House, which in turn was influenced by an un, sadly unrealized project, which I admired of Bob Venturi's called the White House, which you can see on the right. It also, next slide, was influenced by the White House by um, uh, Aldo Jurgola, um, who I had gotten to know at the same time I got, as I knew Bob Venturi and um, whose work uh, I admired uh, more for its sort of softer, um, uh, ro more romantic uh, turn uh, as seen in the interior of the house in Chestnut Hill for the whites. Um, but and you can see how that spilled over into my interiors in the Ehrman house. Next slide. Um, Bob Venturi's renovation, a very early work of Grand's Restaurant, which was a kind of student uh, hangout at the edge of the Penn campus. It had been called Moms, uh, and then it got the name Grands, and Bob was somehow given the responsibility of a new sign and a symbolic uh, marker, this folded plane, series of planes uh, of a teacup. Um, uh, um, uh, at, uh, that in turn unleashed, I would say, as much as any single project, the postmodernist um, exuberance of the late 70s and early uh, 80s, which can be seen in my work in the best products proposal for an exhibition at the MoMA, um, uh, which a variety of architects were invited to design facades for the catalog share showrooms that best the kind of um, a prototypical uh, uh, um, no, and I can never remember that gigantic company, which I've never been inside from the South of uh, 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 catalog warehouses um, uh, here. And you see our, my design for it. And if you read across the facade, you read across a person's life cycle measured in terms of uh, consumer goods. So the embrace of the postmodernist to the consumer culture at this time was extremely important. Next slide. Um, Howe's French work uh, and the work of other architects uh, 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 was very, uh, becoming very much more interesting to me, in particular, the architect Robert Rhodes McGoodwin, um, a little less uh, paid attention to than he should be, who developed, among other things, something called the French Village, which still exists, a series of houses along um, uh, some deliberately planned streets that create a intimate scale within uh, Chestnut Hill. Next slide. Um, uh, that inspired me to thinking about how one could impart, inspired me to how one could modify the um, gridiron plan of uh, um, outer borough areas, particularly 
the Brownsville, East New York area of Brooklyn, which um, was uh, largely abandoned at this point. Um, uh, the old buildings had been burned down, sometimes deliberately by uh, uh, frustrated landowners and what have you. And what was happening was that the subway in its elevated extension was running virtually empty, not because of a pandemic, but because there was nobody living in these neighborhoods to take it to work. There are other reasons for that. I won't go into it, but Subway Suburb was my contribution to the Venice Biennale, the first time that there was a section devoted to architecture in the, uh, a very long range, long living um, and uh, uh, art exhibit. Now there is an entire year devoted to the architecture section every other year. Next slide. But in 76, when this scheme was done, um, uh, uh, it was a part of the first uh, uh, serious uh, uh, devotion of the Biennale to architecture. On the left is my a proposal or the reason, the raison d'etre in a way, to argue that you could have houses that were dignified. And in fact, each house proposed on the left is really meant to be two houses and that the suburb could live peacefully with the downtown, just as Center City and um, uh, Chestnut Hill are both parts of the city of Philadelphia, but they offer two different ideas in complementary form to each other. Uh, St. Martin's um, group um, uh, right before the First World War was another exemplar and there are many more that I that Bob Venturi in particular took me around to introduce me to this wealth of invention that was Philadelphia's gift to architecture in the first uh, 30 or 35 years of the 20th century. Next slide. Uh, inspired by what I saw in Chestnut Hill, I was asked by a developer to propose something for this uh, very nice piece of land, which had been a farm, um, but was already surrounded by suburban development in uh, Ocean Township, New Jersey. So I took the French village, if you will, um, uh, uh, as an inspiration, and we did get to build, and there is the plan, um, and we did get to build a number of houses in this uh, before the um, uh, economic collapse of the late 80s put a kibosh to the project. Next slide. Also from in Philadelphia, the work of Wilson Eyre came to my attention. It came to my attention through Vincent Scully's brilliant book, The Shingle Style, of which Eyre's work is, plays a very important part. But Eyre had been basically forgotten. And in fact, I would say he's still basically forgotten. But I took upon myself to research with um, people in my office as many air projects as we could find that had been published in the journals in the, from the 1880s until the late 1920s. Um, and he, here in a house sadly demolished, the Asher's house, but which Scully places a great deal of importance to, um, is on your right. And it was a direct inspiration to a house at Wilderness Point which I worked on with another design partner and former student, as was Roger Seifter, Columbia student, um, both of them, Randy Correll. Next slide, please. Now, um, another building in Philadelphia, which intrigued me um, and has subsequently inspired me, but, but which has never been given its due, or perhaps not, maybe now is being given its due, but certainly not uh, when I was a student or uh, in my early years as an architect was the Custom House by Ritter and Shea um, in which the Georgian architecture of the Independence Hall environs was reinterpreted in a major scale for a building developed by the federal government. It in turn inspired uh, our handling of 222 Berkeley Street in um, Boston uh, which we were given the commission for when Philip Johnson's building seen to the right uh, caused a huge um, uh, kerfuffle among back bayers back who said that they didn't think it belonged in Back Bay. So we brought from Philadelphia to Back Bay, a building which we then brought back to Philadelphia in the form of 
the uh, uh, apartment building, 10 Rittenhouse Square um, uh, of the early 2000s. Next slide. Um, now I mentioned Paul Cray, who's an amazing architect and he has been uh, given some important treatments by uh, architectural historians, um, uh, but his work hasn't been as honored as possible as it might be, but we were given the commission for the uh, new headquarters for the Federal Reserve Bank in Atlanta, which had occupied two previous buildings. And we brought, were asked to bring forward the classical columns, which had stood outside those two buildings. And they gave us the inspiration um, for our design, as well as the desire to connect with the Federal Reserve, both its building in Philadelphia, and most especially the headquarters building uh, in uh, facing the mall in Washington, one of the great public buildings in Washington, and maybe the last great building in the classical tradition to have been built um, before the Second World War, and maybe ever since in Washington. Next slide. Uh, in Philadelphia, we have turned our attention also to the, uh, to the late Georgian early Republican architecture um, uh, built, uh, asked by the Church of the uh, uh, Jesus for Christ for, of Latter-day Saints to build a chapel next to an apartment building, which was also our design. We made our chapel in the mode of um, uh, uh, small religious buildings where they were then large in the late 18th century or uh, in Philadelphia, but we took them as an inspiration uh, which you can see here in the photo on the left and on the inside um, with um, a ceiling uh, in part inspired by Sir John Soane's uh, hung ceilings in, his, uh, in many of his work in the early 19th century, but also with by the austerity of the meeting house tradition that um, the Quaker meeting house and other early religious buildings that one finds in Philadelphia. Next slide. Um, uh, we've found ourselves in an interesting situation over time, um, building both for Drexel University and the University of Pennsylvania, and um, in each case, reinforcing or trying to reinforce the diagonal walkway, Woodland Avenue, if you will, that when I first got to know the Penn campus, there was still a trolley car um, coming up out of a tunnel onto the campus. But that diagonal for connecting uh, 30th Street Station with these two great institutions of higher learning um, has now been revivified by my efforts and those of others. We began with the new business school um, and dormitories, residential apartments <coughs> for Drexel. Next slide. And more challenging was the building for the McNeil Center for American Studies where Mr. McNeil, a great scholar, uh, the donor of Ameri early American studies, um, uh, early American uh, art and culture, uh, was adamant that the building reflect the purpose of, its, um, of the institution he was funding. Um, this, of course, flew in the face of the prevailing, um, uh, still lingering modernism um, at Penn which um, uh, argues that buildings should be uh, exactly of their time. And I question how a building, why a building should be of its moment when by the time the building is finished, that moment has passed. I think the build building should be about the continuity of time, not the exclusivity of moments from one to another. In any case, this is our McNeil Center. Um, uh, you can see it uh, as is a gateway building to the main campus at Penn. Next slide. Um, and it has about it a kind of austerity and abstraction of the way we chose to handle the brick and the window framing um, that is uh, both uh, based on early uh, 19th century um, a Philadelphia precedent, as you can see here in a proposal unrealized for the president's house 
in Philadelphia before the capital was moved to District of Columbia and in Khan's own work at Phillips Exeter Academy, where you see here his library um, and also next door his uh, dining hall. And where interestingly enough, we are now at work on a project um, in that very interesting Georgian inspired one, uh, campus in New Hampshire. Next slide. The inside of the McNeil Center carried forward the idea of an austere uh, classical uh, set of uh, rooms uh, for, uh, for uh, socialization and study um, uh, by the fellows and faculty of this institute at Penn. Next slide. With Daniela and her firm, uh, we have uh, collaborated on two significant projects for Villanova. And although I said this was my Philadelphia story, uh, I, I hope that um, Philadelphians will uh, um, forgive uh, incorporating, incorporating Villanova into this talk. Um, the first of our collaborations is a, is a series of uh, dormitories along Lancaster Avenue, uh, a street uh, that was uh, forsaken to parking for a very long time. You can see how we folded the buildings around courtyards, used the local stone, um, uh, similar to what Howe and his partners had introduced earlier in Chestnut Hill, but not the exact same stone, and created court, open courtyards um, with the uh, light rail running behind it. Next slide. Uh, here you see other views of the housing on the left, but you also see <clears throat> a fact that Wilson Air, <clears throat> one of his most interesting late buildings is at Villanova, Austin Hall, and that became the direct inspiration for our work there. So we go backwards to go forwards always in our work. Next slide. Kev, uh, Kevin Smith, Graham Wyatt, and others were partners in the work on this, um, uh, 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 in our work, in our part of the work on it for Villanova. And here, a new theater has just been finished. It's really not quite been opened uh, for performances. It's, it concludes the Lancaster Avenue Row. And again, I hope demonstrates how one can, in going backwards, can also do a new kind of expression for the campus, more open, inviting the students and faculty and the public to events. Behind it is a garage, which we managed to turn, um, uh, uh, to transform into a building of some civic dignity. Would that all garages were that way. Next slide. Um, I want to end on the subject of the American Revolution Center. We were first hired to build a new building for this um, uh, important uh, but brand new institution, which was busily finding its feet, as it were, its footings. Um, and we were hired just after the new century began for a site, well, to find a site in Valley Forge Park, um, which we ultimately found a fairly interesting site commanding a view of the Schuylkill um, and we tried but tried to design it and did I think design it in such a way that it could be buried into the landscape. It's hard to tell that from this model but a great deal of the building would be underground so that the building would be minimally obtrusive for a variety of reasons ranging from funding from federal policies, from the local objection, who tended to see Valley Forge not as a national uh, park, uh, um, but, but as a place to jog um, and to recreate, um, uh, the site was abandoned. Next slide. But good things came of that because we were given an opportunity to design again for the museum, but in a much more strategic location right in the center of all the historic buildings that um, surround Independence Hall and Carpenters Hall, 
right at the as the foot uh, hill, if you will, for Howell and Shay's Custom House, and a place where the historic buildings um, butt up against what is left of the city, uh, uh, the Victorian city that didn't fall to the records ball um, when I, in, in the 1950s, where I began this lecture. Um, here you see the problem of a building that has virtually no windows, since museums tend to either have skylights or no windows, natural light at all. Also the need to enhance the streetscape uh, with um, shops uh, serving the, the museum, but also the public as a whole, and to create an important plaza at the corner to give identity uh, to the building, and then to lift up uh, uh, a, a suite of rooms at the top, uh, which are meeting rooms now, but may eventually be devoted to an expansion of the museum uh, in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can see this. I hope you know this building and have visited it, <clears throat> uh, uh, but we studied very carefully the uh, so-called federalist architecture of the that came just after the revolutionary period. It seemed appropriate um, uh, to the scale of the building uh, and to our um, sense of this as an important building, but part of a larger uh, picture of historic building. It replaced a building that was built for the bicentennial, of which I will say no nothing except that it is not missed um, uh, by any, as far as I know. Next slide. And in conclude, uh, here's the inside. Again, um, it's a, a museum in the grand tradition of, of museums, as you might imagine them in the 19th century, appropriate to the scale of large scale his history paintings and other similar um, works of art. Um, and then off to the sides uh, to um, uh, curated uh, didactic exhibitions aimed to explain the revolution and its heritage into the future. Next slide. And so I would like to end with where I began in a way where the site of um, the, the ruined site of the center of the city where I'm in, uh, of independence the vicinity of Independence Hall, I should say, where I've been given an opportunity to add one more piece back into the puzzle uh, to replace a building not loved, which in turn replaced buildings that were ruined in scale in condition, but were potentially loved. Um, and um, to say that uh, Philadelphia has been my architectural home, uh, as, uh, even more in some ways, that New York people think of me as a quintessential New Yorker, which I suppose I plead guilty to, but I really, architecturally speaking, uh, find my home in Philadelphia. So thank you for paying attention to me. I hope I haven't run too much over my time. Thank you. The uh, questions I believe can be asked to uh, by uh, electronic means. Danielle? Oh, that was, that was lovely, home? Bob. Thank you. Did I do what you wanted? If I, I didn't, don't say it. Other questions? No, it's just so impressive and so wonderful to hear, Bob. It's really, really fantastic. Well, I thank well, you. At this point, um, please submit questions in the Q&A and we can moderate them and direct them toward Bob. Um, while we wait for those to come in, um, uh, Daniela, do you have a question maybe that you want to kick off? <laughs> um, hmm. I, I mean, I don't know if it's a question. I, I just want to say that, um, you know, I've, I've read your, your book, Bob, on, on George Howe, um, which I know is done so many years ago. Um, but I've been a, a huge admirer and um, of Miller, Meggs, and Howe, and many of the same firms that, that you mentioned this evening, um, in terms of inspiration um, to my own work and, and that of the, the kind of the, 
people who are practicing in the 70s and 80s that were were um, you know likewise looking back to those those uh, seminal um, period between you know before the the Second World War, and I just wanted to say that um, you know I, I've been so grateful that that you did that work because I you know kind of gets into the question of well how did he have that that crisis how how did did he make that incredible jump and um, I found it very useful and of course um, illuminating. So I think you do have some questions at this point. So I'll pass that back to you, uh, Leo. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Joseph Pierce and he asks you, Bob, do you think the contributions of Horace Trumbauer are, are overlooked due to Philadelphia's city status? Uh, Trumbauer is a, a very interesting architect um, especially since his chief draftsman was an, uh, I, um, I, I don't know if he qualifies an African-American, but in any case, um, um, uh, uh, um, not a Caucasian. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and who was better known, by the way, than people say he was. Um, he was not kept in some sort of dungeon. He was out there and people knew his work and his role in Trumbauer's office. Um, but uh, I think Trumbauer is a funny architect. He doesn't quite fit into a category of trying to engage with Philadelphia per se. He was a, 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 a mansion man, um, and, but he was very good. When I, whatever style he took on, it was very good. I don't much, I, you probably, nobody probably cares, but I don't think so much of his Duke campus, which I, uh, the men's campus, which I find a little pinched in scale, but um, he also did the women's campus. Now they've been merged, they're a mile apart. And that's in the American uh, um, uh, neoclassical post-Georgian style. So he was a master of styles, um, an amazing figure. And Philadelphia is lucky to have what remains of his work uh, in on the main line and elsewhere. Thank you, Bob. Um, I have another question from David Linetti. Uh, first, he compliments and says, amazing lecture. And he asks you, what is one book you recommend every aspiring architect should read? George Howe by Robert A.M. Stern, of course. I, I, there's no one book. If you're just going to read one book, you're dooming yourself. There's a, a, a shelf load of books you should be reading. But certainly complexity and contradiction in architecture was is a seminal work learning from Las Vegas, more quirky, but very interesting. My book on how um, uh, uh, other books that I've written might be of interest and many more just punch the word architecture book in the Amazon thing and see what tumbles your way. Thank you, Bob. Um, I have a question from Philip Goad. Um, who's just asking you to comment a little bit more about Aldo Jergola in Philadelphia. Were any well, I know Philip when he was living in New York or, or America. Am I right, Philip? Well, we can't answer, but yes. Um, uh, um, uh, and um, Aldo Jergola uh, 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 practiced in Philadelphia and New York in two offices. He became the chairman of the Department of Architecture at Columbia after uh, Paul Rudolph, uh, uh, he was, he turned down the job after Bob Venturi was passed over for it and ultimately Charles Moore got it. But in any case, um, Jurgola won the competition for the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the uh, legislative capital of Australia uh, and moved his, himself um, and his family to Canberra where he spent the rest of his career with only occasional uh, trips to the United States. Um, I think he was a very interesting architect, not as interesting um, as he might have been. And I think it's a miracle that he got the Canberra building built, given that it's uh, so complicated to get work of that scale built in, uh, and, um, uh, um, uh, in our time. And it's worth, I have never, vis I've visited Canberra but I've never been there when the uh, capital was built. 
So I can't, com I don't like to comment on buildings I don't know firsthand. Thank you, Bob. Um, Spence Cass is asking if you might want to say something about your apartment project in Elkins Park from the 1970s. It was only an interior uh, for some people named Kastner. Um, it was that period when I was finding my way from the, uh, uh, my education at Yale was basically modernist. Um, but of course, I, uh, 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 Rudolph was already moving his own direction past orthodox modernism and other people like Jack Robertson, an older student from me. And the Kastner apartment was a real challenge because of the uh, space that we were given, the, a long skinny space in an awkwardly designed apartment building um, um, in, in Elkins Park. Um, but I had a lot of fun doing it and the, and the client, particularly Mrs. Kastner, was extremely indulgent. <laughs> Spence, um, did you work on that apartment? I can't remember. Um, Bob, do you have, uh, have it in you for one more question for an aspiring sure. young architect? One more. From Benjamin Garza, what advice would you give to young students who are not in university yet and who are passionate about classical architecture and becoming classical architects? Well, um, uh, it's, I think if you're going to be passionate about classical architecture, you have to be a little bit of an autodidact today because there's only uh, Notre Dame and, and some education and classicism that I uh, know of at Yale. There are a few other places that have a classical component to their curriculum, uh, but I think you should, um, first of all, look at classical buildings you should travel, you should do, make drawings, um, the role of hand drawings or measured drawings. It's very important to get it in your fingertips, so to speak. You should turn off your computer for a while, let it take a nice snooze. Um, uh, not that I'm against computers, but I don't think they're design tools. I think they have other purposes <coughs> in architectural practice. Um, if you're not in architecture school yet, I assume you're saying you're in an undergraduate program uh, in, um, in a college. So you should go study with Daniela at um, Bryn Mawr, uh, which is a good place. I don't know, I don't know enough about you, so I can't uh, answer your question in an intelligent way. He, but he I have think to go to Haverford. <laughs> he has to go to Haverford. Um, okay. Uh, one of the leading practices, practitioners of um, classical design today in New York is Gilbert Schaefer. Gil Schaefer went to Haverford, Yale, where he studied under and was the favorite student of Bernard Chumi. And then he worked for Bernard Chumi and George Howe liked, but only after a year, he had a soul Paul conversion and became a classicist and the head the founding head, I think, in a way, of the ICA in New York. Okay. Yep. Bob, Thank Bob, you you've been inspirational and so um, insightful. And uh, every time I listen to you speak, I, I learn something new about my own city. And um, thank you again uh, for such a thoughtful talk and spending this time with us for this hour and the many hours I'm sure you put together. Um, you know, you took putting together the talk for us. So thank you, Bob and Leo. Thank you also for, um, you know, I'm sure shepherding along uh, the production of a great, 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 great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela, for your kind words. And thank you for inviting me. And thank you for all of, all of you who have taken the time to um, uh, put your martinis aside for just a bit and tune in. Or maybe not. Maybe you had your martini and tuned in. That's what I would have done. Good night. Good evening to everybody. Bye-bye.